And I wasn't using the mic. Um, yes, welcome to Agape Chicago Church. We're so glad you're here. Um, we want to welcome also our friends online who may be on the church online or Facebook. And um, we're just so pleased to get together and be able to worship our Lord in song and in his holy word. And so um, we're going to begin now with just a few announcements. In your bulletins, um, we would love you to connect with us. There's a, a place where you could uh, connect with us if you would like uh, to have more information about Agape. And um, hang on a minute. I knew something was wrong. If you would like to know more information about Agape or have any requests from us, there's also a, an a, a area there for a prayer request. And our elders love to pray for you. So please go ahead and don't be shy and write your prayer request down. You can put that in the offering basket when we pass it later. Um, okay. That's about it for that part. And this, the rest of the announcements are concerning our agape communities, and uh, which is our ministry to the Rogers Park area. And it's um, four, four different, five different uh, ministries that I'm just going to, the leaders are going to speak for a minute. The first one is Blue Sky Cathedral, and that's uh, led, led by Steve Johnson. Can you tell us a little bit, Jay Steve? Yes, uh, Blue Sky is a ministry that operates on the streets of uh, Rogers Park, and we're out uh, about once a week uh, just passing tracks and hot chocolate uh, and uh, potato chips and just kind of drawing people in uh, toward loving Christ, knowing who he is, and uh, just offering them guidance guidance and prayer in that regard. We have been operating around the weather over the past couple of weeks, so I can't say that we'll be out on Thursday, but our normal day outside is Thursday, 6 o'clock, Howard Street at the uh, Polina train station. So if there's something that you're interested in, mm -hmm. please uh, touch my shoulder. We can talk about that. Okay. We also have a women's prayer meeting, uh, which I'm leading, and we've been meeting now for over a year, about a year and a half, when we were all on lockdown, and so it's, it's been a real blessing for the women here at Agape, um, and it's on Monday nights at 6.30, and my email is, is in your bulletins, and if you would like to join us, join us, uh, please contact me so I can get your email and invite you to come. Um, and it's been a very encouraging time when we get together for our prayer every week. And so um, we just welcome anyone who would be interested in that and, um, and just go ahead and let me know. We also have um, Living Well, which is a, um, a ministry to our elder people in a nursing home. I don't know if anyone's here for that. I am. Oh, okay. Hi. We try to encourage them in ways that we can. We've been having a Zoom Bible study meeting but as I said last week, the residents still are not allowed to congregate among themselves. So that the, so the Zoom Bible study will be on hold at least until then. But uh, please pray for them. A nurse, being in a nursing home is hard in mm -hmm. any case. Confined, being confined to your room, that makes it much lonelier. Yes. Thanks, Scott. And we have Living Well, um, I mean, I'm sorry, Works in Progress? Yeah, Works in Progress is going to meet January 31st at the McCausland's house. We're retooling our vision a bit, uh, but it'll be at 6.30. There'll be tea and tea cookies, and we hope to see you there. And the last one is No Returns, which is our ministry to uh, refugees and immigrants in Rogers Park. Uh, yeah, our next meeting is February 6th, which is Sunday, uh, two Sundays from now, so not next Sunday, but the following Sunday is after church. Um, at, so it's 1130-ish. Um, and if you aren't already on our email list with reminders about that, let me know and I'll get you put on. Okay, thank you. And one more announcement that's a, a real, um, we're going to have a, a celebration here uh, on February 13th of our 10th anniversary. And so we are just so excited about that. And there's going to be cupcakes and balloons and fellowship and fun. And so we just hope that everyone comes, invite people to come and just celebrate with us. Um, and that'll be on the 13th after our service here. 
And so um, we just pray that you'll come and it'll be a blessing to you to learn about our journey of faith here in Rogers Park. And that is about it. And our music team is going to come and sing about the Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. All right, if you want to go ahead and stand up with us, we're going to do a couple songs to worship the Lord.
Thank you so much, worship team, for directing our hearts towards the Lord. Um, we would like to have the children be dismissed, and it's going to be Drake, I mean, not Drake, Dennis and um, Dallas and Sarah. We've been going through Genesis, and uh, this morning I'm going to be reading to you uh, Genesis 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is in your own flesh and blood will be your, your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So, so, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of Chaldeans to give you this land and to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these things to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for four hundred years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go down to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To our descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenzanites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphites, Amorites, Canaanites, and Gergesites, and Jebusites. Man does not live by bread alone. But every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Pastor Steve will come and bring us our sermon today. Good morning, Agape Chicago. Go Molly with the reading. Yes. <laughs> uh, good morning. It's good to see so many people here this morning. Uh, hopefully we will all take something with us that will help melt that snow out there. Let's have a moment of prayer, please. Father, we want to thank you uh, because your word is precious to us. It guides us in how we should uh, approach you, Lord, and help us to increase our faith uh, this morning and help that faith kind of pour something out of us, Lord, that will glorify your name as we walk through the week. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray and say amen. Amen. This morning, I'm about to give you the best get-out-of-jail-free card that anyone can have. Salvation for nothing, heaven for free. Am I afraid that you're going to go out and run amok in sin? Not really. Uh, if you walk out of here and don't do anything different, you might be already in sin, run amok. But if you walk out of here, with your faith in one hand and God's power in the other, even though you know it's not about your performance, you just might do some work. But that work will be work which flows out of your faith rather than an effort to obtain 
or maintain or sustain faith in righteousness. The point that I'm driving at this morning is simply this. Only when we bring our faith in God together with the power of God will we find rest in the promises of God. I need to repeat that. Only when we bring our faith in God together with the power of God will we find rest in the promises of God. The first thing that I want to offer this morning is simple. Faith alone leads to righteousness. Faith alone leads to righteousness. We find that in Genesis 15, verse 6. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. This has been called the Old Testament gospel. The word believe is used for the first time in the Bible at this point. And Abram's example shows us that faith alone produces righteousness. Faith alone saves. It's always been that way. It will always be that way. And when you look at where this verse is placed in the context of the Bible, this verse, Genesis 15, 6, comes before two very important events. One, it comes before the covenant at the end of this chapter. We'll touch on that. And two, it comes before the law of circumcision. Genesis 17, which is only a sign of Abram's righteousness. Before both events, which many Jewish people depend on for righteousness, God declared Abram righteous by his faith. Faith alone was sufficient before any of those things took place. And because this verse is quoted several times in the New Testament, it is the... It is a cornerstone, a, a bedrock, a foundation of Christian teaching. In fact, we often think that righteousness by faith is strictly a New Testament idea, but it's not. If we continue through the book of Genesis, and we will, we'll see that God does a bunch of stuff with Abram. He changes his name to Abraham. You'll see me use that interchangeably. He gives him a son, Isaac, through Sarah, finally. He even tests Abraham with the challenge to sacrifice his son. And then you come to something that is really interesting in Genesis 26. This is the Lord talking to Isaac. Genesis 26, verse 4, 5. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and will give them all these lands, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Why? Because Abra, Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. Now this language, commands, decrees, and instructions is the same kind of language that the Bible used to refer to obedience to the Mosaic law. But the law hadn't been given. So how is that possible? How could Abram obey the law if he didn't have the law? Because his faith taught him. His faith was sufficient to guide him in righteousness. The law didn't have to be written down. It didn't have to be rolled in a scroll. It didn't have to be bound in a book to let him know what he needed to do. But, but this example of Abram has tripped up some of the heavy heads, the teachers, the, the scholars who actually have misunderstood this passage. Here's what they'll tell you. They'll tell you that the only way Abraham could have known these commands, these decrees, these instructions, Mosaic law language, was for God to sit him down, say, like in a power lunch, and to lay it all out there verbally, like an oral tradition. God sat him down and basically said, okay, we're not going to put this in Genesis. We're not going to bother with that right now. We'll get to that when we get to Exodus. What I want you to know, Abram, is that you got to do this stuff. Don't, don't worry. Later on, I'll, I'll put it in Deuteronomy and in Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus. One commentator said, he parlayed before him not with words, but with deeds. That's no gospel. 
Another said, Abraham's faith is a little thing if measured by words, but a great thing if made good by action. That's no gospel. I mean, that would make Abram righteous by what he did rather than by his faith. In other words, they'll tell you that Abram worked hard, he tried to be a really good guy, and God sort of rewarded Abram because he deserved righteousness. That's a flawed way to understand this. And we fall into that just naturally because our inner experience and our outer actions are prone to wander in the, into that direction. That's why we have so many works-based religions in the world and legalistic denominations. Listen, if you're here today and, and you follow Jesus Christ, you have faith in Jesus Christ, and if you're in your Bible, if you're in prayer, and if you listen when the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord speaks to your conscience, then I don't have to tell you not to murder or not to steal or not to sleep around or not to lie. You don't need for me to get a big old book or, or, or a whiteboard or, or project it on a screen the words do not murder, do not steal, do not lie, do not sleep around. You already know that. If you're walking by faith today in the power of the Spirit, I don't need to tell you to be a person of integrity. You already know that because your faith in a living God who lives in you, who dwells in you, who fills you with his Spirit is sufficient for you to be guided, sufficient for you to fulfill the commands of your God. God never, ever, ever, never, never saved anyone on the basis of the law, ever. What does the book of Galatians say? No flesh will be justified by observing the law. That way never works. And when we understand the Old Testament like it is, like it is to be read, it has always been the way of God to save by faith. Never by works. Never by keeping the law. Never ever. Abram did it solely by faith. Abram trusted. Abram had faith. Abram believed the Lord, and he, the Lord, credited it to him as righteousness. It is faith alone that leads to righteousness. So now the foundation of faith having been laid, I'll ask you this question. What good is our faith if we don't believe that God can do what God says he can do? Point two. Only when we bring our faith in God together with the power of God will we find comfort in the assurances of God. Now let's go back and collect Genesis 15, 1 through 5. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will become my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, look up at the sky, count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said, so shall your offspring be. And in my Bible, offspring has a footnote that says seed. And Abram believed the Lord. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And you remember in Genesis 14, after defeating a group of five kings with his little band of 318 soldiers, Abram turned down the king of Sodom's offer to the spoils of war. He kind of did it with an attitude, basically saying, I swear to God, I wouldn't even take a shoestring from you. I wouldn't want anybody to think that you made me rich. Yay! 
So now he's got new and powerful enemies who are likely to retaliate. And he's anxious about that. I mean, he's even afraid about that. After that, Genesis 15, 1, the word of the Lord came to Abram. In the Bible, the word of the Lord comes in many different ways. It can come by a personal appearance by God. I don't think that this is that. It can come by the ministry of angels or an audible voice. It can come by the working of the Spirit in our minds, or it could make alive a, a passage of, of Scripture, or it can come in the ministry of a prophet or a preacher. In Abram's case, the word of the Lord came in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. In other words, instead of the stuff that your enemy offered you, Abram, I'll be your protection. I will be your reward. And if you look at a footnote in my Bible, it says, your reward will be very great. And since this is the word of the Lord, it's a promise of protection and reward. I mean, God's already promised to make him into a great nation in verse 12, and in chapter 12. In chapter 13, brought a promise of descendants as numerous as the dust of the earth. And even though there was some roller coastering in Abram's faith, Abram's faith trajectory was always obedience toward God. I mean, he left the land of his father. He went to the land that God showed him. He trusted God to work out that crazy land deal that he had with his nephew Lot. So there's no reason to doubt. But there is reason to long for the promise to be fulfilled and to ask about it. And with humble boldness, that's what Abram does. He asks about it. Sovereign Lord... What can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You've given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. In those days, if you did not have a child, you can adopt someone to be the guardian or the heir of your estate. And usually it was the person who was doing all of the work of a son. Did Abel's question mean he doubted God? Yes, and yeah. But listen, there's a difference between doubt that denies God's promise and doubt that longs for God's promise. Abram wants to believe, and he's looking for God to strengthen his faith. He's like the man whose son was healed by Jesus in Mark chapter 9. I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Genesis 15, 4. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is of your own flesh and blood will be your heir. So he took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. That's a lot of kids. That's a lot of kids. I mean, I, I love the nighttime sky. It is really one of those things that really rocks me to my soul. I can't tell you where Orion is or Andromeda or Pegasus, and I can barely point out the Big Dipper. But of all the things in creation that speak to me of the power of God, it's the night sky that wells up in me a sense of awe and amazement and, well, a whole lot of fear. Years ago, I was at a retreat, and it's away from the city lights, way out in central Illinois, and it was a crystal clear night with so many stars it looked like God had spilled milk on the floor of the basement of heaven and there were thousands and thousands of stars in the sky and I just couldn't help but think what power what power it takes to do that professional stargazers say there are about 6,000 stars in your field of vision when you look up at the sky. And if you multiply that 
by the number of mental photographs you have to take in order to capture the whole sky, then you've got a Milky Way galaxy with about 100 billion stars. And then based on, on their calculations, there's about 2 trillion galaxies in the universe. 100 billion times 2 trillion equals a whopping 200 billion trillion. That's 200 with 21 zeros after it. Number of stars that can be observed from Earth or its space-based telescopes. And that stretches to a ceiling of 14 billion light years. Whoa, what power! They say that's about 10 times the number of cups of water in all of the oceans on this planet. Whoa, what power! That's a lot of kids. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of, it's too many to count. You could say that that's the top slice to the dust on the ground bottom slice of bread of a big old meaty promise. And whoever did all of that, they can do whatever they say they can do. And that's why Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abram, 75 years old, with a wife past childbearing age, brought his faith in God together with the power of God and found comfort in the assurance of protection and reward in children. God is not like Uncle Jimmy in June, my brother Jim would promise to get the kids something for Christmas. One year it was My Little Pony, Girl Dad. The next year it was Game Boy. The next year, Nintendo, all 80s children's toys of desire. And for six months I hear, Uncle Jimmy's gonna get us a My Little Pony, or Uncle Jimmy's gonna get us a, a Game Boy, Uncle Jimmy's gonna get us a Nintendo. And then when Christmas came, Uncle Jimmy came up blank. Here's the thing with Uncle Jimmy. Uncle Jimmy got his glory at the moment of the promise. Uncle Jimmy's promises had no value because time and time again, he proved that he didn't have the power to keep them. After a few years, the girls finally caught on. Me too, after buying the toys that he said that he would buy. <clears throat> but when God, when God gives us a promise, he has the power to fulfill it. He, he's going to make it possible. He's going to see that it happens. He's going to find a way to make it happen. You got faith? God's got power. You bring those two together, your faith and God's power, and you can find comfort in the assurance that God himself will be your shield and your very great reward. You bring those two together, your faith and God's power, and you can find comfort in the assurance that God himself will meet your needs. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19. You bring those two together, your faith and God's power, and you can find comfort in the assurance that God will answer your prayers. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you, John 15, 7. You bring those two together, your faith and God's power, and you can find comfort in the assurance that God himself will satisfy your soul, James 4, 8. Come near to God and he will come near to you. The certainty of these promises, friends, are no different than what God gave Abraham. God ain't like Uncle Jimmy, or the rest of us for that matter, who have a problem keeping our problem, prom promises. You, me, we can be fully persuaded that God has the power to do what God has promised. Only when we bring our faith in God 
together with the power of God when we find comfort in the assurances of God. Third point. When we bring our faith in God together with the power of God, God's power commits to our faith. Genesis 15, 7. God also said to Abram, I am the Lord. Hear that? I am. I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. Abram's looking for assurance again, so he makes another humble approach. He says, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. And what follows is one of the most amazing covenants that God has ever made with a man. Abram gathers up his various sacrificial animals. He cuts them in two. He drives away the birds of, of prey. And as the sun was setting, Genesis 15, 12, Abram fell into a deep sleep in a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And that, that's when God really gets down to the serious business. While Abram is sleeping, the Lord tells him everything that's going to happen. His descendants will live in a foreign country. They'll be mistreated. They'll be live as slaves. And then finally, after 400 years, they'll be free with way more stuff than the king of Sodom offered them. Abram, God says, will live a long prosperous life, be buried with his ancestors at peace. And not until the fourth generation when the sin of the people who live in that land is complete, has risen to its peak, will God bring Abram's descendants back in to possess the land. And of course, scripture bears all of this out. And here's where things get really really interesting and somewhat dramatic as well. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, Genesis 15, 17, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. Hmm. In those days, the most serious contracts were made by cutting the animals in half and laying their split carcasses on the ground. And then what each party to the covenant would do would walk between the body parts at the same time they're reciting the terms of their agreement. They called it cutting a covenant. The covenant was so serious, it was sealed with blood, with the implication being, if I break this covenant, let the same bloodshed be poured out on both me and my animals. On that day, Genesis 15, 18, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants I give this land. From the Wadi, which is a river of Egypt, to the great river, the Euphrates. And this marks the southern and the northern boundaries of the promised land. Here's what I want us to see here if we have not zoned out. The Lord, symbolized by the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch, was the only one to go through the ceremony. In passing through the carcasses, the Lord is saying, may I die if I don't keep my commitment to this promise for you. And what's Abram doing? <clears throat> he's sleeping. Abram is in a deep sleep. He's laying down, he's copping some Z's, he's getting his beauty rest. And you know what? If Abram had taken part in this ceremony and walked through those pieces with God, it would have been up to Abram as well as God, to keep this covenant. It would have been a conditional, and the faith that claims the promise because of the power of God would have been dissolved in favor of Abram's obligation. He would have to work. So God took him out of the picture, basically saying, this is my 
commitment, this promise. This is my promise. This is my responsibility to bring this promise about. The Lord is the only one to show up for the ceremony. The Lord is the only one to commit himself to this covenant. And that's because the Lord is the only one who has the power to make absolutely certain that this covenant, this promise comes to be. This is now an unchanging, an unconditional, an unrevocable covenant. A commitment by God to a promise that cannot be set aside. No work required on Abram's part to receive the promise. With the help of the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians, I want us to understand what this promise to Abram really was. Galatians chapter 3, verse 15. This is written by the Apostle Paul, verses 15 and 16. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. The promise to Abram was that Abram would have a seed who would bless the nations. And this is the seed of a woman that we have been tracking throughout the book of Genesis. Seed can mean a lot of people, like sheep can mean a lot of people. Seed can mean a lot of sheep or one sheep. Paul makes the observation that God intended to bring one seed that would fulfill the promises that in that seed was Jesus Christ. God kept his promise all the way through to the coming of Jesus Christ. The time the promise was given to Abraham until the time of Jesus, it was not yet fulfilled, but God committed to his promise that he would make people righteous through faith. And he eventually brought that seed that would bless the nations, Jesus Christ. The closest thing I think we might have to that kind of covenant is perhaps a marriage covenant. Big ceremony, big promise, sometimes big breakups. Even big plan to break up if you have a prenuptial agreement. But, but that's not what God intended. That's not really a promise, is it? Or the other covenant we might all have an engaged in, perhaps a mortgage. When you make a covenant to pay a mortgage, you sign, you initial, you sign, you initial, you sign until your fingers are all cramped, and then you're locked in for 15 or 30 years. And if you break that covenant, you lose your home. Or last will and testament. Your descendants after you would receive your blessing through a promise that cannot be set aside. How much more so the promise of God, friends. The promise God made to Abraham can't be set aside. You don't have to work for it. God's already committed his power to it. And this is so antithetical to the way we live. So you get a job, and you show up for your first day of work, and you punch the clock, and you work. And you work how many hours that you have uh, agreed to work. You punch out at the end of the day, and you do the same for many days thereafter until the pay period is done. And then on payday, your boss gives you a check. But, but what if they don't? That, that violates this thing. I do, you pay. Maybe you work another pay period. Maybe, you know, maybe they'll eventually get to you. But at the end of that pay period, you still don't get a check. And what do you do? You quit. And you might call the authorities, the labor union or somebody. I mean, the assumption that you make is, if I do the work, then you will pay me. That's how it works. It's just the way we're used to doing stuff. That's why God's promise that he'd make people righteous through faith in Jesus Christ is so hard to accept. I mean, in virtually 
every area of our lives, every area of our lives, our law-based tit-for-tat, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back lives, is based on, I do this, you give me that. But when we think about faith, we have to think about it simply. It's just such a simple, simple thing. Here's a simple way to think about it. The law came after the promise. The promise came before the law. There it is. There's a promise made by God to Abraham, and the law which came after it did not add to it, nor did it take anything away from the promise. It did not set aside the promise. And if all the promises of God are yes and amen, and if God is not a man that he should lie, then God will keep his commitment to all of his promises, those made to Israel and those made to me and you. When we bring our faith to power. God's power commits to our faith in him. And that's reassuring. There's no righteousness apart from Jesus Christ. He's done the work. He's taken the punishment that we deserve for our sins. He's died on the cross. God has raised him, giving us and him victory over death. And whoever, whoever puts their faith in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You don't have to do anything. This promise business isn't about Abram being asleep. It's about God following through on his promises. It's not your performance that matters here. This is a matter of God saying to you, I have committed myself to do these things. I have made my promises to you that I will keep. And not just this one. God said, <clears throat> be confident of this, that he who had began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. God has promised you that faith in Jesus is all, all, all you need to get to heaven. That there won't be a, a quick question when you get up there like, uh, spell Jesus is Lord in Latin. You know, it won't be like that. Or, or, hey, hey, I got some other law that I didn't tell you about, and then, you know, did, did you keep it? No, 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 no. God is not going to do that. This is it. Faith in Jesus Christ. Surrendering your heart, your life, your mind, your soul to Jesus Christ for the glory of his name. And just as the faith of Abram looked forward to a coming seed, those who put their faith in Jesus Christ look forward to the day when he will return and redeem this entire universe for his glory. So take your eyes off of how you're doing. Take your eyes off of how well you've conformed to God's law and any churchianity rules. Place them on the God who promised to make you holy. The God who promises to bring you home. The God who promises to redeem this universe. Because we can't possibly do that ourselves. Only when we bring our faith in God together with the power of God where we find rest in the promises of God. Let's pray. Father, help us to see ever so clearly that you accept us, Lord God, when we come to you no matter what and give us the salvation, Lord God, and the motion, the moves, the motivation to glorify your name in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Steve, for that beautiful sermon, an insightful and encouraging sermon. Um, 
Right now we're going to, uh, it's time for our offering, and it's time we to take the opportunity to um, give to the work of the Lord for Agape Chicago. So our ushers are going to come forward um, for you to do that, and uh, our music team is going to close us out with another beautiful song. Thank you so much.
Uh, I'm just going to send you out today with a, uh, one, one of the prayers from the Apostle Paul. And this is from Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. And all God's people said, Amen. amen. Yes. Yes and amen. <laughs>